my resume went to the old owners, they then forwarded on my information to the new owners at the same time as their chef had you know, pulled the pin. I look back at it now, and there's no way I would make that decision now with a 47 year old head, but it's a difficult game to play and it's not a, a true indication of success. The, the core basis of what we wanted to achieve, we've achieved, which is pretty, pretty, pretty special. It's extraordinary. Welcome to Not The Rob Bell Podcast, where we talk with business owners, marketers, and professionals to extract what makes people and businesses successful. Hey everyone. And thanks for tuning in to Not The Rob Bell Podcast. Today's guest, I've got Scott Fox. He's a co-owner in a local restaurant and he's been there for 17 years. We talk all things working with your spouse, managing teams and how to outlast your competition in a cutthroat world. It's coming up now. All right, so Scott Fox from Pearls on the Beach Restaurant, your head chef and co-owner over there. Can you tell us a little bit about your restaurant? Um... Absolute beachfront. I think it's the only one that I can think of on the central coast. We've got, oh, I tell a lie, we've got a few, few in around Terrigal that are. We won't talk about yeah, those. Yeah, let's not talk about them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, step out, of, step out of the restaurant onto the sands uh, in beautiful Pearl Beach, a little secluded southern um, suburb down there. And uh, beautiful. Sort of little hamlet, isolated community that gets a lot of Sydney exposure. So a lot of people who. Um, come or know Pearl Beach, know of it from their travels from Sydney where they've been holiday houses, weekends away. Mum, great auntie, grandparents used to own a house. We get that all the time. So, yeah, sure. it's, it's, it's a sort of a unique little part of the coast. And so so we'll, we'll probably touch on the evolution of Pearl Beach a little bit shortly. But uh, uh, so you actually bought this business 17 years ago. Yeah. It um, seems like – well, I've been working there for 20 years, so – it's um, it's even crazier when you look at it like that. And I yeah. think uh, I said I mentioned it all, quite a bit that you measure uh, chef years and hospitality years as like dog years. So, ah. <laughs> so so it's really lo- like almost a millennia now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah I'm, I should have a couple of gold watches by now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's been a while, but that's uh, I suppose that's uh, that length and uh, longevity is is due to the fact that we've got a. Got a business that's very much lifestyle orientated, so we we've we've made it so that it works for us, and and we um we love going to work, you know. So, I think that's an important thing. And uh, so, you would have been quite young when that opportunity came about. And you said you've worked there a little bit longer, so you're obviously working there as a chef. I'm assuming beforehand. Yeah, yeah. So I was employed as the head chef under some new owners. Uh, they'd recently bought the restaurant. They'd organised a chef from Sydney to move up. He um, pulled the pin on he on he moving up from Sydney. We'd only moved up from Balmain about a uh, year year and a half before that, and um, and I just was looking for a new job. I'd help help a mate start a cafe, and it was more cafe food, and I'm more of a restaurant chef. So sure. it was um, you know an opportunity to to get out there and get back into restaurants after working for him for that time, and put my resume out to what I thought were the better restaurants on the coast, and which I could see myself working it and uh, and pearls was one of them and um the my resume went to the old owners they then forwarded on my information to the new owners at the same time as their chef had you know pulled the pin so it was all this little uh, perfect timing sort of scenario and um interviewed we both liked each other and uh yeah so i started there as the head chef then um 20 years ago, so. Wow. Yeah. And so a few years later, the opportunity to purchase the restaurant came along. And so how old were you when that happened? Uh, 27, I believe. Okay. Yeah, so pretty young. And was the evolution from head chef or chef to business owner something you'd always anticipated or was it just opportunistic? I think there's a little bit of both. I mean, I think every, well, not every chef, but a lot of chefs, when they get to the head chef position, you know, there's a bit of, progression through the ranks and you're kind of in a mindset to to better yourself and to to move upwards um so i suppose every every head chef sort of thinks or hopes that they could probably do their own business because we work long hours for other people and you always kind of think oh well it'll be nice to have the reward for all the hours that we put in for ourselves so it was always sort of back of the mind sort of thing i wouldn't mind owning my own place sure i don't think i'd ever thought that we'd jump into the deep end of a of a you know seventy seat fine dine restaurant, but um, 
No big deal. No big deal, though, no. And my wife, um, at the time, her experience within hospitality was, you know, filling in kitchen hand shifts whenever someone went sick or something like that for me. So it wasn't it wasn't like we were a hospitality family. She had hotel management hospitality experience rather than um, the restaurant scenario, so... And so, walk us through that that conversation where uh, you've you've gone home to your wife Melissa and and said, "Hey, darling, uh, you know, did you have a great day? Oh, by the way, I want to buy this restaurant." That's pretty much how it went. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was pretty. Uh, so, what do you think about um, buying the restaurant? And she she kind of yeah, whatever, because we'd only like I think six months before had uh, bought our house, so we were mortgaged to the hilt and. And uh, just trying to get our heads around paying paying the the, the loan off, and um, and then I walk through the door and say, hey, how do you feel about buying the restaurant? Because the owners came to me and said, look, we're we're thinking of selling, offering you first first bite of the cherry sort of thing, and um, and um, I said, but you know, it makes money. It's 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 a viable business. Yep. You know, there'll be getting loans and stuff back then was a lot easier than it is now. So it was you know something we could facilitate. So. We started to explore a bit further. We'd moved up from from Sydney for a reason. We're both country people, so it wasn't um, always going to be a permanent thing in Sydney. So moving to the coast was sort of like a stepping, not not as far as jumping straight back to the country, but nice uh, interim sort of scenario. But I mean, to the coast even now is quite different. It is a bit, yeah, yeah. But I mean, even more so from Musselbrook or Young, where we're both from. So, okay. so. Um, we used to come up to the coast for weekends to get away from the rat race and, and it was sort of like one particular evening we were in Sydney and it was pouring down rain and people were pushing each other to get on the bus to get home and <laughs> it was like, yeah, no, nah, we've got to get out of here before we go crazy. So, um, so yeah, so that evolution was, was um, you know, we took some fairly big steps but I look back at it now and it doesn't seem that big a deal. It was just like... We're not happy where we are. What are we going to do? We're going to do this, and we moved on. And same with the business. It was like the business has sort of had been, or what I could do in the in the time I was the head chef there was I could do what I could do without you know sort of appeasing someone else's requests as an owner. And um, so the opportunity to then be the owner and then evolve it to what I want it to be. Uh, was sort of a too good, too good an opportunity to turn down. And like I said, it was a big jump. We'd sort of, it's a sort of business that you would imagine you'd have second or third businesses, not your first business to cut your teeth on. So it is quite a leap. Yeah, it was a big, big leap. But I think it's one of those leaps that uh, the bravery of youth allows you to do. Bravery, stupidity. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I look back at it now, and there's no way I would make that decision now with a 47 year old head. But um, when you're young and impetuous and you think you can take on the world, you do those things. And I suppose we were very fortunate. We had a lot of support family-wise t- um, with that decision and and and, um, and it, thankfully it worked out, you know. it's um, But it was one of those things that in our mind it could not work out. Like it was – there's there was no – never a, oh, well, if it gets hard, we'll just sell it or close it down or do whatever because – you know, we'd put our house, new house on the line. Sure. And our parents had put up their both their houses as collateral as well for loans. So there was a lot on the lot on the table. So Of course. So when you took that leap, uh, did you have a, a bit of a runway plan in place, say, you know, we'll we'll flip it in, in five years, or were you in it for the long haul originally? We'd, we've always been in it for the long haul, yeah. It was a it's a it's always been um, an expression of us uh, that, that we look back on the the uh, business plan that we put, penned for the bank when we were getting trying to look for loans six months before we um, bought the business and you look at it today and it's like yeah we ticked all those boxes and continued to do so like it's um it's quite a cathartic experience to actually look back on plans you've made with that head but it still rings true now which is kind of really um, rewarding scenario because I mean I mean it's evolved and and diverged somewhat over the years but the the core basis of what we wanted to achieve we've achieved which is pretty 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 special it's extraordinary I yeah. mean I mean it's no mean feat but it's particularly in hospitality there's quite a high uh, turnover rate of business owners and that sort of thing you know did you was there moments there where you thought perhaps maybe that wasn't the smartest decision to own oh, your own restaurant? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. I think in every business, you know, you have your ups and downs. But, yeah, definitely there were times where 
you know, we were counting the counting the numbers and, and what was coming through the door and it was like, it's going to be tight this month or whatever and we'd had to reinvest monies back into the business at certain times when, when you know, through the, uh, you know, financial crisis and stuff like that. But we've stayed pretty pretty uh, buoyant mainly because we're owner-operators. I mean, uh, our two big salaries are head chef and manager and, and we fill those two roles. So. Sure. Um, and also affords us the ability to evolve really quickly if the if things change because we're we're very tactile with the business. You know, when when the business is open, we're in we're in there working it. So um, if there is a problem, we sort it out straight away. There's no chain of I'll put in a form for someone else to or okay this this chain Feedback of actions. So, yeah, yeah. So there's none of that. It's just like a direct like yes or no. Enact the um, you know whatever. Um, strategy we have to do there and then so I think that's sort of helped us especially current day you know with the COVID scenario it's um, you know we've we were a uh, a fine dine a la carte restaurant on a Sunday night and then we reopened the following Thursday as a takeaway so Pearl's at home so it's um, you know and I'm seeing restaurants now advertising that they're reopening for COVID it's like well You've missed out on seven weeks of trade, guys. Yeah, sure. So we'll come back to COVID in a second. Um, What I'd like to touch on before we get there is uh, obviously husband and wife team and had you guys worked previously together or was this uh, a new concept? No, we we had worked together. Um, We actually met at university. Uh, We lived in the same dorm. I was downstairs, Mel was upstairs. I spent a lot of time upstairs. I was going to say sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and we, um, I was doing, Mel was doing uh, um, hotel management, uh, bachelor of hospitality, and I was doing food science and nutrition uh, with the view of sort of getting into the sports nutrition and stuff like that. Uh, that degree didn't really head down the way that I thought it would. Um, but in the meantime, we were working for a catering company, um, just doing like roast stuff uh, very low grade stuff out in the western suburbs of sydney but we were working together to pay pay our way through uni and um, i was enjoying that more than i was my degree and that's when i made the decision to to uh start my apprenticeship at uh, at 20 rather than 15 and and um so yeah we had we'd always worked together in that regard um and she's my best mate you know we've been best mates before we were going out so it's sort of it wasn't it was that that wasn't a big leap to make when we bought the business and got into it, um, which I suppose kickstarted us the business uh, at Pearls a lot quicker than it would otherwise would have. And we've got very complementary sort of skill sets, like a, my, mine being more operational and obviously a lot more experience in in the restaurant trade. And Mel's was definitely more uh, managerial. Um, human resources, all that sort of stuff. So we complement each other quite well. Um, I think it would be difficult to work with your partner if you're doing the same tasks, like two chefs would be difficult, two front of house would be difficult, but for us it's either or, so we've kind of got all bases covered. So I guess while you're working in the same business, you sort of have your your independent paths through the day. Very much so, yeah. uh, And there's always the... uh, the sly look at each other when we cross those boundaries is like mm, back <laughs> off <laughs> and it's like yep okay yep you'll hear about that when you get yeah. home. <laughs> well that's another good thing we never take the, the the stuff that happens at work home you know and that's and it's inevitable you you're going to have the, the, the anyone knows anything about uh, hospitality there's the uh, the us and their mentality from the floor in the kitchen uh, we don't allow that to happen in our restaurant I suppose our relationships being front and back um, further enforce that and you know it's natural you're going to have arguments and disagreements over certain things but um, they're always resolved at work as work issues and never brought home as a as a couple issue so and so extending that dynamic to uh, your respective teams front of house and and back of house teams uh, how important is is having that team play on both sides uh, in terms of getting you know I've worked in in kitchens before getting a dinner service out and yep. You know, having everyone in their right position, but also having that respect for chain of command. Like, how do you navigate that balance? Yeah, well, it's a it's the utmost of importance. You know, you can we've we've we go to restaurants, and you can you can tell when that's not right. 
you can feel it as a customer. There's a real energy and a it's like a storm cloud hanging over the whole place. And and also I've been to restaurants where you it's exactly the opposite, and you and you have a much much more enjoyable experience as a customer in the places that get along. And uh, the days of the the chefs, you know, yelling and screaming, and throwing pans at people, and and being right with without any question of a long gone. You know, we we're very much a, a family down there. We we look after our people, and they they look after us. It's pretty simple, simplistic attitude, but it's worked for us for the last twenty years. We've got quite a small staff turnover for hospitality, especially. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's not uncommon for chefs to be working for us for five seven years before their situations change and they have to move on for other jobs or they move up to take on head chef roles at other restaurants or things like that so it's generally never someone leaving because it's not working at work it's because they're evolving and becoming you know the people they need to become Uh, and that's because we build that team mentality and yeah the kitchen hand um, you know, eighteen-year-old kitchen hand who comes in on the weekends to do the dishes, or myself, you know, are just as viable and have have an impact on how we run our business. You know, we we try and involve everyone. You know, encourage our staff to eat out so they can see how other businesses are run and be a you know be integral in that in our industry. Um, everyone has an input in the menu. So someone comes through the door and say, "Hey, I just went to this restaurant. And they did this, this, and this." And I said, oh, "That's a good idea." And you know, we, we, we've got whiteboard markers and we write on the wall and it might be just lamb rump. And then someone else will write, you know, mint sauce. Okay, what do we do with mint sauce? Okay, well, <laughs> let's turn it into a sorbet or let's do this or, you know, or a marinade or whatever. And it, it sort of spiders out and, you know, in two weeks' time we'll have a, a dish that evolved from one person writing lamb rump on the, on the wall. And it might be a chicken dish by the time it gets there. <laughs> but, it, you know, everyone's involved and... and and doesn't feel that they can't have an input on that on that wall, and um, sometimes it doesn't make sense. But it's breeding that environment, which is sort of big big part of our success, I think. And so there'd be a a bit of a balance there between trying to foster loyalty and uh, and sort of longevity with in terms of those people being involved with your business. But I can imagine you want to support that professional development and keep their skills sharp as well. How do you sort of strike that? Yeah, I suppose hiring the right people is the, is the first step. Um, we've, we've always been big believers in trusting your gut. Um, we've only ever made two decisions, I think in our 20 years where we didn't trust our gut, where we had a gut feeling and went against it because we did seek advice from someone else sure. and they and, and and they did those two things didn't work out so intuition and in in, in, in that hiring process is is pretty inte- integral with how we've moved forward um and i suppose the longer you're in business the better you get at that sort of thing as well i mean earlier on the piece you sort of i was learning on the job as much as everyone else so i think at the at the moment I'm t- I'm in a stage where I'm sort of trying to extract myself from the day to day nitty gritty everything running to myself and just sort of being a bit of a an overseer. Still very much hand, hands on, but I mean, it used to be that I was, you know, doing everything and trying to do everything and and realizing now that you can't do everything and you have to, you know, let people have their reign and and also use your skill sets more effectively because I'm more effective as a manager if I can see the whole picture rather than being stuck in one corner, you know, bogged down. On a grill. You know, yeah, exactly, with my back to whatever's going on. So and so does that take a bit of, like, self-assessment and self-actualisation to, you know, see that happening before you? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I think um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big sort of goal and – holistic sort of person i'm i'm very physical hands-on tactile person so um you know i can feel if we do a service and it's not quite a hundred percent it might be you know acceptable for most of the industry but i'm not happy with it and i feel a little bit uncomfortable about then you know i'll sit down and have a beer with the guys and we'll have a chat and say hey what happened tonight you know that that didn't work or that did work or whatever it was and and invariably you get to a solution pretty quickly and it doesn't fester 
And then the next day it's like, okay, cleared the air, got whatever was off our chests and we move forward on. And it might be a small edit to how we do things. Or someone might not have spoken up when they felt they should have. And, you know, it's really simple stuff. So it's not terribly um, self-analytical on a personal level, but I think as the business, the business is an entity in itself. And I suppose the good thing about having great staff is that they're very involved in, in that analysing of what is good and what's not good. And I think if you get confidence in your people, then they'll tell you, hey, this isn't working for me or this is not working for me. Get sorted out, move on, move upwards. Sure. And obviously uh, everything that you do come, can be influenced, like whether it's right or wrong, can be influenced by, say, a customer taste. And uh, how important is it to, in your industry, listen to your customer and but also assess when they're right versus when maybe they're not? Yeah, it's really important. Um, you know, the old adage that the customer is always right is wrong. Um, and that might sound arrogant, um, but it's true. You know, I've been cooking for nearly 30 years and I do know a little bit about what I'm doing. Made more steaks than I have. Just a little bit. So when someone comes in, they go, that's a well done steak. And I go, "Mm, yeah, it's actually not, it's a medium, but you know, you, you, you can't be that blunt with people. Um, but I suppose, um, with the knowledge that you know, you're right, then you can communicate to someone not in a degrading fashion, but more of an education fashion. And that's sort of the phase that I find myself professionally moving into now is or do, engaging a bit more with the, with the customer, having a chat, being a direct link to them. Like we get so many people with um, dietary complaints these days. I don't think there's a, a service that we do without someone being intolerant or allergic to something. Sure. Um, and my science sort of background comes has become very handy with regards to that initially um just having that little bit more knowledge of nutrition has sort of really helped with that sort of thing but instead of like a customer communicating to a waitress that they're allergic to this that and the other and then that waitress coming back into me and then me communicating to the chefs we just cut out the middlemen i go straight to the person and say hey what's your problem what's your issue and they then have the confidence that this guy knows what he's doing. He's taken the time out to come and to talk to me. And I think that's that evolution has been really important for, for the next steps of our business and how we how we move forward. Sure. Um, I can't remember what the first question was, where we got to that one then. I don't know. But that was a <laughs> pretty matter. good answer anyway. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter. But, um, yeah, so that, I'm really enjoying that, that direct contact with customer. Um, and I think customers like it too. You know, we, we kind of – chefs can be – sort of pigeonholed as robots sometimes when it's stuck behind this wall, you know, burning and cutting ourselves and, and all of a sudden food comes out. And so it's nice to put a, f- a face behind it and, and to directly engage with, with uh, criticisms as well as compliments. Uh, thankfully, there's more of the latter than the former, but, you know, you've yeah. got to wear those ones if, you, if they come. Of course. And, and so obviously uh, this brings us to an interesting topic around customer feedback and Obviously, in in the digital age with e-commerce uh, and you know in retail environments and that sort of thing, feedback is something of a of a new sort of um, way of operating of accepting that feedback and, and skewing accordingly. Uh, but in hospitality, in particular, and even though the method has changed now, and it might be a Facebook review as opposed to a critic write up in a newspaper, like how has that? environment changed and have you guys had to do anything differently to accommodate that um not i suppose it's changed dramatically i mean everyone's a critic nowadays and there's so many platforms for people to to air their grievances or or give compliment unfortunately i think it's more the grievances that get put forward rather than compliments people who compliment and enjoy a meal you know leave a big tip, thank you so much, best meal we've ever had, blah, 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 That's, which is amazing. And they'll leave and they might tell four people that they had a great experience. Someone who has a bad experience won't tell you, won't allow you to fix it there and then, might even still leave a tip, but yep. then turn around five minutes later and give you a one-star review on all of the... While they're skulking off to the car. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, 
that could have been a, a a problem we could have fixed so easily if or 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 at least explained a scenario and and explained to someone that you you actually not right on your grievance. This is what happened and this is why it happened and they've got they will get a bit of an education and you know next time they'll know what to expect of whatever the problem might have been. But yeah, the whole going and just blurting it to the world and and it's quite can be quite venomous. Like we it's a we're a passion industry. We love what we do and we really, you know, put a lot of hours and time and effort, blood, sweat and tears into it. And for someone to sort of shred you on a review for not knowing what the hell you're doing and it's you know, your first reaction is to get your back up. Um and then it hurts, you know, like we'll we'll stew on a on a bad review for weeks and weeks and weeks sure. and you know it um rightly or wrongly it hurts um there's it's very difficult to deal with stuff like that i've i often find that if someone's going to go to the lengths that some people do go to and thankfully we got very few bad reviews <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> which is which is lovely but um if someone's willing to really badmouth your business and go that far, it's one of those things that we try not to fuel. So I don't tend to try to appease someone. It's it's really I think it's gone too far generally at that stage. Um, if someone's got a, a a genuine complaint in the restaurant, then it's a I'm a mate, I'm always willing to to you know to own it and say yep we dropped the ball. Sure. How can we make it better? Um, but engaging online, it can just add fuel just to the fuel fire. It just fuel to the fire online, yeah. Um, I suppose that's the the part of the um, the industry which is I don't I don't see a way forward. I don't see how we can rectify that because it's so easy for people to to jump online and just ruin someone. Sure, and it's it's like some of it's like bullying. I've seen some restaurant reviews, and it's just like, oh wow. I don't. I know how upset I get when I get someone saying, "Oh, my steak was steak was tough." So if I, someone completely destroys someone's um, personally, would be really difficult to deal with. Um, I don't know how. I don't know how we move forward on that either, because it's it's so easy for people to jump online and do it, but I don't think there's any right answer as well. I don't know. It's a really difficult one. I mean, it's an interesting challenge and. Particularly with reviews, I think there's a certain amount that people can recognise in in when they read other reviews Most that it is yeah. spiteful and yeah. and that it's just you know yeah. and you can see communities defend um, d- defend people against yeah. some of those trolling behaviours, which is um, you know quite good to see. Yeah, obviously it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, but obviously those reviews can be discounted quite easily. How has the sort of formal review process, say, from food critics, newspaper write-ups, guide write-ups, that sort of thing. How has that evolved over the same period? Um, I don't know if it has. I think it's always been much the same. I mean, good or bad reviews, you've got to, you've got to own them. And I mean, we've had some great reviews from some very respectful reviewers and we've got some bad reviews from some very respectful reviewers as well, you know. Um I don't think you can you can live and die by those reviews. I mean, um, one person coming into your restaurant, having one meal, and judging your business isn't the is wasn't on my business plan all those years ago about pe- appealing that guy. My on my business plans about making as many of all our customers happy as we can, and they're the people who keep coming back. They're the ones who pay the bills. They're keep us keep us you know paying our staff and and paying our landlord and and suppliers and all that sort of stuff so you can concentrate so much on these review review scenarios uh, because there's sort of a, the esteem and the privilege that that's bestowed upon you know getting hats and all that sort of thing but at the end of the day it really doesn't matter it's about keeping the customer happy and the general customer um, needs to be feel like they're being looked after I and mean, especially you know when you're at the pointy end of the pyramid like we are we're charging good money for for the experience they've got to go away going wow that was amazing and i felt like i've been treated like a king um and i suppose if you if you start steering your business towards a you know we're going to get a hat we're going to you know we're going to get this accolade we're going to get make sure we get in the 
you know, the um, Gourmet Travel or Delicious or whatever magazines sure. to any of the time, then you're missing it. You're totally missing it. You know, you, the customer is what it's about, not the not the not the PR exercise. Hopefully, the PR exercise and success will come with keeping your customers happy because obviously, if you're keeping 99% of your customers happy, you're going to have a lot of goodwill. You're going to have good PR on those websites, and someone's going to see it and go, "Oh, hang on, we should look at these guys." Sure. We've always tried to keep it fairly organic um, for everything we do. Like we're a real analog business. We're not super tech savvy. Um, we still do handwritten dockets for the kitchen. Yep. Um, we we just sort of keep it really ma and pa old school style stuff. So there's a real direct contact with our customer, with our suppliers, landlord, everyone like that. So when you start to sort of try to market towards reviewers, I think you lose that tactility of you're not talking to a diner anymore, you're talking to a reviewer and it's a real different mindset. Um, our business has won many accolades over the years and our bottom line doesn't really change too much from when we haven't had these accolades and when we have had these accolades. The, sure. only, yeah. the only thing that changes is that uh, we get an ego boost. And it gives us something to yell about when we want to do <laughs> media stuff. And uh, sometimes that helps. Oh, most definitely it helps. Um, but once again, I think your true repeat business customer wouldn't have a clue that whether I do have a hat or not. And they just go, oh, we just love your restaurant. That's all we're here sure, for. Sure, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult game to play. And it's a game that a lot of restaurateurs play – and it's not a, a true indication of success. Um, yeah, there's plenty of hatted restaurants that have fallen over, especially in the last five, ten years. Of course, yeah. And there's plenty of restaurants that never get a ride up anywhere and they still keep on ticking along and, you know, the owners have drive a nice car and live a very comfortable life. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. So on, on that topic of customer, um, obviously the, the coast, Central Coast has changed a lot in that period of 17 years of owning this restaurant. How have you seen the customer evolve and have you had to adapt accordingly or you were always on that track? Uh, we always wanted to evolve the restaurant. Um, I came from a not a fine dine background but, a, you know, a casual fine Dine record, and that's very much where we sort of see ourselves now. Um, so when we moved to the coast, we started in a cafe sort of scenario, and 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 um, and that was very much of the of the of the people. You know, there was the, the, the customers on the central coast were very casual diners, and I think over the years that the amount of fine dine or finer dining diners has increased with the you know migration of people from Sydney sure. moving up here. I mean, it's all the coast has always been built on people people wanting to get away from Sydney. So, um, it's um, just maybe now they're doing it on a daily basis as opposed to well, a, a weekend too, stay. Yeah. Well, that 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 in itself has changed the dynamic a little bit as well because you've we've we've always sort of had uh, been the summer destination, the, the central coast for the beaches and whatnot. Um, but I can think back when we first started, like the business midweek business was a lot bigger than it is now and I think a lot of that is because there's a lot of people who do commute to Sydney every day and the last thing you want to do when you've been spending three hours a day on a train <laughs> is then jump back in the car to drive to a restaurant you know and you know the coast is a big place so you've got to, you've got to travel wherever you go you know unless you live in say Terrigal and you can pop down to Terrigal but sure. to get to Pearl Beach from Terrigal it's a half an hour drive yeah but someone's gonna have to stop drinking Proper at some stuff yeah and uh and or taxis a hundred bucks each way that sort of thing so you know it's a, it works it adds up so therefore the people sort of start concentrating their dining habits i think towards the weekends um for for, for restaurant proper license you know fine dine restaurants so that definitely has evolved our our mentality i think when we first started one of our most popular dishes would have been fish and chips which you know everyone knows and loves and um, my goal was to always get fish and chips off the menu. I just, you know, it throws the balance of the menu out. You know, if you're selling 80% fish and chips, then you're only selling 20% of everything else. And sure. so, so the idea was we want to have a menu that's really balanced and everything sells fairly evenly. Um, we evolve our menus quite a bit uh, anyway. So, 
once we got to that stage where I thought we were, you know, pretty ensconced in in the business, we had our heads around it, good customer base. That was when we sort of think, okay, we can start sort of really making some changes here and change, not massive changes, but model changes with you know where the weight of the menu is now towards smaller dishes, entree sized dishes rather than the traditional entree main. Sure. Um, so we call them smalls, main size, large dishes. The idea being, you know, three small dishes equates to an entree in a main, um, in a you know, reg, uh, more formal setting. Sure. Um, the idea being trying to get people to have that one extra taste. You know, you, 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 there's quite a bit of science behind the whole how we perceive flavour and taste, and and uh, the theory is that you know, you, if you're having a nice 250 gram steak, you taste the first half, and the back half of the remem- is the memory of the first half. Sure. Um, so we're sort of trying to play off that and say, well, if you taste the whole thing and then have a new taste, then you're having a whole new sensation and, and a real experience. So, um, And that evolution has increased our skill sets and how we have had to learn more about our product. We're constantly learning. We've had to, like I said, train staff and make sure we've got the right people who are on the, on the page to, to, to do better themselves and to be better. Um, so all of those things are, are sort of fairly integral on the journey. Um, we don't do anywhere near as many numbers as we used to. I think we used to do, you know, wouldn't be uncommon to do 120 covers for a Sunday lunch sure. back in back when we first started. But the per heads were maybe 20 or $30 a head. Now we're sort of doing, you know, 50, 60 covers on a Sunday lunch, but our per heads are like a 100, 120 a head. So, sure, okay. So we've worked off the um, increasing the per head spend offering more more to the customer uh, for that and um, so the whole work smarter not harder sort of thing brilliant yeah so I mean obviously we could probably go down this uh, food science rabbit hole side of the business yeah. um, but I think we'll probably run out of time pretty <laughs> rapidly so maybe hold that for another time uh, but obviously uh, as we mentioned at the start COVID came along and knocked restaurants uh, effectively overnight um, and how rapidly did you guys pivot to uh, to keep things going? And, and was that, um, you know, how much effort went into that? Yeah, and it's sort of we've only just, I think I said last night to the guys, we, we sort of finished scrubbing down the kitchen and and I said, okay, that's week seven done, uh, or week eight. And uh, I, just, I just went, I think we're getting ahead around it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, but um, it was it was massive. I mean, we kind of will that that lead in with the reduction in how many people we could do. Like it was like one person per one and a half meters was the first reduction, and then then it went the next week. It went to one person every four square meters. So we were mapping out how big our restaurant was, how yeah. many people we could fit in, and then it went to no restaurant, just takeaway, and. Uh, and we went when the reductions to one person per one and a half meters the couple of weeks before I said to the guys I said I think we're going to have to start developing a takeaway menu and everyone went oh yeah whatever <laughs> and I went oh okay maybe I've got that maybe I'm reading this wrong and um, and then the reductions kept on growing and I turned around and I went well it was kind of fortunate that I'd already made that sort of mental step. So we may need to do this. I didn't seriously think that we would have to, yep. um, especially not a week later, but here we are. And, um, yeah, so like I said, we, we, we finished service on Sunday night and then we, we, we're only open Thursday to Sunday for lunch and dinner those four days. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, not open to the public, but those, uh, those were some pretty busy days for me, those three days, getting, getting a menu sorted, um, packaging the big thing that's uh, – you know, totally rejigging your how you approach food when it's not going on a nice plate and going into a box. And, and on that topic, how how do you cater for that drastic change in customer experience in terms of a, a brand integrity aspect? But also, if they're taking food home and say it's it's not hot when they get home, like how do you navigate those waters? Yeah, it was pretty pretty muddy waters too. Um, 
but I think more so in my own head, not so much in customer experience. So we, we'll, my big thing was we've spent the last twenty years developing pearls on the beach and who we are and and our customers, our law customers love love what we do. So for me, changing our model to doing burgers or pizzas or whatever, which is a you know a traditional takeaway model, didn't make any sense whatsoever. Sure. It was like well. It's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's, you know, we've got to stay true to who we are and what we're about because otherwise we're just competing with everyone else and we're kind of losing our customers that we've spent time building. Um, but then the problem in lies there, how do you how do you do, you know, casual fine dining food in a box? Um, fortunately, our style of food is not finicky, you know, tweezered, tortured food it's sure pretty robust real, you food. Know, real food you know I, you walk away from do, a dining experience having tasted different flavor combinations and maybe some different ingredients but essentially you'll feel satisfied so that we didn't have to combat that scenario um and we just wanted to keep it really um wanted to people to go home and have the pearls pearls on the beach but at home and that was the whole concept we the first thing we did was a f good friend of ours is a, a looks after our website and stuff for us. And she said, what do I have to do for you to get you go up and going for the takeaway? And we said, look, let's rebrand Pearls on the Beach. So it was a simple strike through our logo and putting at home. Yep. And and that sort of, as soon as we did that, it sort of clarified where we go, how we move forward. Getting the packaging right was important. Um, Pearl Beach is a national trust village, very green. Um, so we you know, doing Chinese takeaway containers wasn't going to cut it, so we're doing biodegradable cardboard scenario. Um, they don't hold moist food very well, so we've sure. got a greaseproof liner underneath it. The idea being, you know, you take it out of the box, slide it onto your plate at home. And our customers were amazing. Like in that first week, I think 80% of people were taking photos of their tables and sending them to us and saying, hey, look at us, we're having pearls at home. And awesome. So that was really cool. Um, and it just really um, motivated us to, to be better and to do better. Um, the first couple of weeks was difficult, more difficult, I think, because we'd had, we've already had stock, you know, we, you know, and you can't just throw it out. You know, sure, so it was yeah. like repurposing food and going, there were certain dishes that weren't, no way they could be done at home. Um, steaks was the biggest drama we thought of. So by the time you cook a steak, rest it, put it in a box, take it home, it's either cold or overcooked. And so we made a decision, we're not doing steaks. It's that yep. simple. Concentrate on what we knew would work and then sort of have expanded it out from there. We've been pretty fortunate because Pearl Beach is that little hamlet, um, fairly affluent um, suburb. So we're lucky that we don't have to sort of compete on a price bracket. Yep. Um, we'd had quite a few people move up from Sydney to their holiday houses bef before the COVID thing. I think there was quite a bit of information going out to the CEOs of companies before uh, a week before sort of thing, before the shutdown. And, yep. and they'd seen the writing on the wall through their experiences in their offices overseas and whatnot. So they, they, they were moved up before it all really happened. And they weren't going anywhere. They're used to dining and, and what we do as well. So we've, we've sort of, we're in a bit of a bubble down there. And um, it's not lost on us for sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's there's just us and the little takeaway general store across the road, and we work really closely with them because, you know, they provide, um, you know, burgers and fries in the general store scenario. We do the the dining scenario. Yep. And I think it's it's been re that's one of the upshots of the whole scenario is how how relationships have been developing a lot more closely sort of can get a little bit stuck in your in your world and worry about what you do but sort of there's a lot more community now I find like we're working together a lot we've always worked together well but it's a, I think it's a bit more of a we've got to get through this and there's a real camaraderie which is which is tied in the community quite nicely I, I feel a lot more connected to my customers than I than I ever did and I'm not doing what we used to do so that's sort of quite strange but the, that's the positive to take out of stuff like this i mean talking of relationships uh with your customers in particular i think one thing that you mentioned there which was quite interesting was 
you're not just dealing with the immediate panic of transition, you're conscious of the snapback when things lift and things go back to normal. Yeah. And how how are you guys preparing for that outside of, uh, you know, as we are seeing restrictions um, predicted to ease, um, how are you uh, planning for that return and how how pivotal do you think the way that you've handled this transition period, how well do you think that positions you for coming back out of it? Yeah, I think it, the the decision to stay true to our our style is definitely going to hold us in good stead. Um, uh, it's not going to be a massive transition menu-wise, so that's a big part of our business, you know, steering our business forward. So that's practica- practicality side of things. I, th- I don't think it'll be that massive. Um, but we're probably not planning on opening the restaurant for sit-down guests until, you know, we get to a, a stage where we're really under control for this and mentally we're thinking probably September. Sure. So um, it, I can understand the guidelines that the government's laid out with regards to, you know, at the moment we're at, well, on Friday, I think uh, we'll be going to, we'll be able to have 10 customers seated in the restaurant. Can't run a restaurant on 10 no. people. Um, so that's, you've got to look at those implementations. There's not a, not a, um, I think a lot of people are getting really upset about, oh, well, we can't survive on that. It's like, well, you're not supposed to. It's, this is a stepping stone. So if you've implemented a takeaway scenario for your restaurant, then keep doing your takeaway. I mean, for us, it's, it's working, you know, we're, we're, um, we're probably doing nearly twice as many customers per service as we would as a restaurant. Um, I keep, I've said this to everyone who will listen to me is like, I'm working twice as hard, but I'm getting <laughs> half as much, you know, sure. but, but it keeps the wheels turning. It keeps wheels turning. I've, I've, we've, um, we've only, we've got one staff member that we've had to sort of, we can't look after, you know, he, yep. he's only been working for us for three months. So he couldn't, wasn't about able to get the job keeper. Sure. Um, everyone else is, is employed and, and, and getting looked after. And that was our whole goal was about, you know, making sure that we don't lose anyone. Um, they keep their families fed. We keep our landlord happy. Um, that was another thing. We got an, straight on to him the first first couple of days of the whole scenario and had, had chats with him about yep. what how we move forward with rent and stuff like that and they've been really good with that. So, yeah, being really open and, and um, you know, honest about our situation. It's like we're not making money. No one's making money, yep. but you can't sort of think about with that mindset anymore. It's not about profiteering. It's about just making it through and trying not to go backwards. Um, having been in business for 20 years on the Central Coast, we're used to lean times, you know. Winter's terrible on the coast for restaurants. Sure. Um, so we've timing of the, of the COVID thing has sort of been a little bit on our side. Coming out of move, summer. Moving forward, coming out of summer. We've had our peak period. Yeah, we've a lot of businesses rely on the um, Easter, Mother's Day period, Anzac Day, which is which is normally quite lucrative, but it's our last hurrah before winter. Sure. So we've missed that. But it could have been a hell of a lot worse. And, um, you know, I've got quite a few friends who've got business and they keep going, oh, but we're down this much from last year. And it's like, it's, you can't. Look at that! You can't beat yourself up about Always that. Always be down more. Yep, exactly. And you just got to keep moving forward. Look, look, look to what what you can do. What not what you can't do. Um, yeah, we've been very fortunate. We can still still open our doors and still feed the public. And and the people of Pearl Beach have been amazing. We're not getting a lot of people travelling to get the food, sure, yeah. but we never thought we would. We thought if we get a few people from Batonga coming over, a few people from your minor, and most of Pearl Beach, that will get us through. And it's seems to be moving in that direction moving forward in the next couple of months will be interesting i think it will be you know we'll we'll start to struggle a bit more because obviously it'll get colder and stuff but then i kind of think well maybe we won't maybe people don't have to have you know two or three people getting dressed up to go out to the restaurant and oh, i can't be bothered you know but sending dad down in his trackies and his and his ugg boots to pick up a ba- couple of bags of food and yeah. go home and eat at home so you know it might be it might be a good winter for us i'm not too sure um, but yeah, it's, it's been challenging, but I'm quite impressed with how we've risen to the challenge. I think it's, um, 
you know, when you've been in business as long as we have, you can get a little complacent and you can get a little bit, we know it all, da-da-da. So little curveballs like this aren't necessarily a bad thing. Maybe helps keep you sharp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think there's lessons being learnt and, and sort of skill sets that we'll implement moving forward that will make our better restaurant a better place, hopefully. So That's excellent. Yeah. So we're coming up on time, but I've got a few quick questions that I'd love to answer. Uh, I'd love to ask you if I can. Uh, no comment. No, no comment. If you had to pick one moment in business uh, that or the, that taught you the most important lesson, what would that be? And it can't be. Don't listen to your wife. <laughs> listen to your wife. <laughs> to your wife. Um, trust your gut. Mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Um, get in tune with your gut and then trust it. And I think. Um, yeah, we've got that, and I, I'm pretty happy with that. I don't know whether you can learn that. Um, I'm not – I haven't done any self-help stuff, so I'm not too sure about all that, but I'm, I'm assuming that the, the antithesis of that sort of thing is to, tr- is to, is to learn to be confident and trust, trust that that confidence is right. Sounds great. Uh, yeah, I, I would have to definitely agree with that one. Uh, if you could pick a mentor anywhere in the world, who would it be and why? The gentleman that I learnt the most about and I look back on how I am as a business person and how uh, he was as a business person, he's probably the person that I I learnt the most about how to be a a good manager and a good chef because he was systematic and and whatnot is a a chef by the name of James Constantinides. He's in Greece right now. Uh, I worked with him for a a while in a uh, little Greek taverna in Sydney called Never on Sunday. And James was, excuse my French, an arsehole of a human being to work for because he's a really aggro chef. He was one of those chefs I talked about. Super, super passionate guy. Very hot-headed. You know, everyone walked around on, on eggshells with James's around. Sure. Um, I seemed to get along really well with him. Um, I think I put it back on him one day and he <laughs> realised he couldn't stand <laughs> over me. Um, but an amazing um, manager. Super, got, knew how to implement systems like looking at a room and just, you know, really new business. Um, so it'd be interesting to sort of uh, spend some time with James again, I reckon. Interesting. And over a uh, pretty good career, is there one decision that you've made that you might have changed if you had your time again? Hmm. Not many, no. I'm pretty – I'm never one to sort of look back, back on things with regret. I sort of think, well, you make decisions, you live with it, you move forward on why you made that decision. Um, there's plenty of business opportunities that have come past us that we sort of said no on. And at the time I was like, oh, we probably shouldn't have said no on that. But then in hindsight now I look at it and go, no, that was a good decision. Not sure. It gets back to that gut thing, I suppose. Um, yeah, not too many, eh? Not, no, which is pretty cool and at the very least you learn really important lessons and i think that's it yeah yeah yeah. it's you know you uh, it sounds a bit wanky to say you know learn from the negative but it's that's the only way you know if you if you if you're not then you'd make keep repeating those mistakes and i don't think you stay in business very long if you do keep making those mistakes so certainly holds true yeah so hopefully uh we'll um learn from our future mistakes as well. Fantastic. All right, so Scott Fox from Pearls on the Beach. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, rattle off your web address, anything yeah, helpful? Yeah, it's uh, pearlsonthebeach.com.au. You um, can check out Instagram, Pearl Beach Restaurant, uh, and uh, Facebook, Pearls right. on the Beach. Um, yeah, we're down can there. Get some uh, really mean takeaway and hopefully some restaurant food Yeah, soon. we'll be looking forward to getting back and opening the doors to that beautiful view soon. Well, that sounds really good. Uh, Scott Fox, thanks so much for your time. We'll chat again soon. Thank you. There you have it. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please like it, share it, or leave us a review on your favourite platform. It helps us show more of this content to people just like you.